Hello and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I'd like to thank my latest subscriber on Patreon, Jacoba, for her support and all my other Patreon supporters. On Patreon, you can hear two new series of interviews. This month, you can listen to my two-part interview with one of the UK's most celebrated timpanists, Peter Hill. And you can also hear a friend of this podcast, Andrew Lytton, take The Mic Test, which is a brand new set of 10 questions. Just go to patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium and you'll find many ways to subscribe and support the podcast. Today, I conduct a conversation with an English conductor who first rose to prominence in 1998, when he became the assistant conductor of the BBC Philharmonic. His career since then has been truly international, conducting in concert halls and opera houses across the globe. It is a great pleasure to welcome Ruman Gamba. Ruman, lovely to chat to you today. I hope you're well. Very well, thank you. And how has lockdown been for you? I personally haven't looked at a single score. I mean, admittedly, I've been busy podcasting. What have you been doing? Uh, well, I had some very good intentions at the beginning to, to look at all those scores I've never got around to. But um, I, I simply haven't. I thought I'd leave it alone, actually. It's sort of a, a bit of a divorce from it all. Um, I've got, uh, I've been gardening and cooking and looking after my family who are working extremely hard both at school and uh, in their jobs so um, I've been a, an IT consultant as well when the computers <laughs> go wrong. <laughs> and a home teacher as well. Well we're fortunate that the, the girls have all their lessons online um, all day from sort of nine in the morning till four in the afternoon so I don't have to get involved which is kind of ideal. <laughs> That's good. Um, talking, talking of teaching let's go right back to the beginning of your, of your musical life and can we find out how music first came into your life? Yes well um, my parents weren't particularly musical I mean that, that, that doesn't sound very good but I, my dad used to play guitar in a folk band um, and you know we've somehow had classical music on at home. I remember vividly Sunday lunches were always accompanied uh, by some classical recording. Um, and so I suppose they were interested, but um, it wasn't until my father's friend at work suggested um, that I should have a go on the cello, uh, on the cello have a cello lesson. Oh, wow. uh, he played the cello himself. Um, I think I played the recorder up to a, you know, some kind of standard or whatever at school and I think my parents were looking for some something for me to play um, and yeah and they, they suggested a cello. I had no idea what a cello was of course so I went along to this um, trial lesson um, and my, my parents didn't really know either so um, it was met a wonderful old uh, cello my old cello teacher um, Nancy Jacks who's no longer with us but she was a really captivating character and I, I fell in love with the cello there and then um, and that was it. My parents said, right, you can do that. And uh, I was a cellist um, <laughs> and obviously, you know, a bit of piano along, along the way as well. So, um, uh, and, you know, I, I played right the way through school. I was, I think there were, there were a couple of other cellists, but um, I was at a massive comprehensive school. Um, There's about 2000 students and a wonderful music teacher there who encouraged me greatly and um, used to wheel me out every occasion, um, you know, playing solo or um, uh, going into the local symphony orchestra in the nearest town which he conducted and playing in that and you know, playing in the pit for Gilbert and Sullivan musicals. I, I got a real um, broad experience of um, chamber music, symphony and other bits and bobs just whilst still at school, which was marvellous. Um, weren't they the most nerve wracking gigs of them all? playing to your school friends in school assembly. Did you ever do that? I remember doing it two or three times and yes, I've never been I, so I, nervous in my life. I, th I think I was all right hiding behind a cello, but it was when I was made to sing in front of everybody. That, that, was, that was pretty nerve wracking, I have to say. <laughs> um, so youth orchestras, local youth orchestras, but also um, did, you get, did you play in the National Youth Orchestra? I didn't. Actually, I went to Pro Corder. Ah, okay. um, which, which was up in Suffolk and they, um, I, I got into that. Um, they seemed to have their courses at the same time as the NYO. So I, I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, but Pro Chord was wonderful. Uh, it's only for strings and yeah. string orchestra, quartets, trios. I mean, you know, again, I didn't know anything about 
chamber music really until I started going to Pro Corder and, and went there for years. Uh, I had a, had a great, great time. I would have liked, I think, in hindsight, to have a go in the National Youth Orchestra, but at that stage, I was really, I didn't really like orchestral music uh, for some mm. reason. <laughs> Well, I've, you know, I remember a, a periods of my life when I didn't like classical music and, was yeah. into, you know, Adam and the Ants or Queen or whatever. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're discovering yourself musically as well as every other way when you're a teenager. So, yeah, I think it's perfectly allowable not to like orchestral music. Um, and then on to further studies at university. Uh, did you study music at university? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, Durham University. Um, three wonderful years. Um, again, I went up as a, I mean, you, did, you didn't, I think you probably had to audition on an instrument to get in, but yeah. um, it, the practical music wasn't, wasn't the focus there. It was, um, you know, all theoretical really and um, research and stuff, but there was a lot of music obviously going on at the university. Um, and you know, I played in a lot of string quartets, earned quite a lot of money by going on playing for, for balls and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, which is good fun. Um, and that's where I took my first steps in conducting, actually, at university. Mm. Um, the university symphony orchestra was conducted by students, which is quite unusual, I think. Most of them were conducted by professors in other universities. Um, and I sort of played in quartets in my first year of, uh, of university, and my friends thought I was sufficiently bossy enough to um, <laughs> encourage me to audition <laughs> to conduct the symphony orchestra and um, I, uh, I remember the audition actually I had to conduct from letter S in Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet um, I had no idea what I was doing um, having never really conducted before but somehow my peers decided that I was to be the one to do two years uh, symphony orchestra conducting which was uh, really wonderful for me great experience and um, you know up into my right up into my neck as it were yeah. in it but um all good fun and did you get any lessons in conducting whilst you were doing that was that part of your university course or or was it no. something you were you were interested in it, it was something i was interested in and i don't there wasn't really anyone who could who could help me up there right. as far as i remember um but i actually went to canford summer school um to do the conducting course there and i I think it must have been in between my second and third years at university, I think, which was a real eye opener. Mm. Two weeks on this um, residential summer course, completely submerged in everything to do with conducting, um, led by legendary uh, conducting teacher George Hurst. Um, mm. Met many wonderful people there, some of who've gone on to amazing careers. Um, and it was, you know, it was just a great introduction. To the, to the whole thing of conducting, whether it's technique or, or, or study, music study, or just the whole philosophy behind it. Um, that, that really started to change the way I thought about conducting and made me think perhaps this is something I could do long term. Mm. Uh, he, he was quite a, a force of nature, um, other people have told me, George Hurst. Um, uh, well, what was he like to be taught by? Um, I know that you went on from there and did a postgraduate at the Royal Academy which was also with George Hurst and his pupil, Colin Metters. But what, what were they like? Yes, George did have a reputation. I mean, he, he, he yeah, yeah, had a very quick temper, mm. um, but was a, was a wonderful musician and, and a wonderful teacher because, he went, like we all do, he had very, very definite ideas about how things should be done. Mm. Um, so you, you did learn actually a lot musically, which I wasn't expecting to I sort of thought that you know w one has one's own musical feelings but he, he was very convincing in the way he did things and had has connections back to the, you know the creation of pieces um his mm. teacher was Pierre Monteur who conducted the first performances of many works including the Rite of Spring um so it's a bit of a from the horse's mouth in, in certain pieces um but he also had a great great technique uh which all techniques should allow you to express yourself how, how you want and that's exactly what he did and he could really control an orchestra so um, you know for me it was interesting to be able to learn a technique mm. um, but also to learn from him beautiful musical things and, and how to get it from an orchestra. Well, it's funny because his name was cropped up rather a lot on this podcast I did some digging around and there are some videos of, of him on YouTube and um, well worth watching uh, and as you say really really clear technique and knew what he was doing and 
and, and there are quite a few videos. I haven't watched them all, but I will watch them. Um, oh, interesting. And, and yeah, yeah and it, I felt that having heard this name repeatedly, uh, I ought to have a look. And yeah, well worth watching. So, as I said, on to the Royal Academy for a postgraduate uh, on the conductor's course and with Colin Metters and George Hurst, but also masterclasses with Sir Colin Davis. Now, did he have a similar approach to Metters and Hurst or was he much different? Um, he, 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 he seemed very different mm. um, at, at the time, actually. Um, we with Colin Metters and, and uh, George Hurst, we had a very rigorous training in in stick technique, um, yeah. which which you know, which was great because you've got to learn to do something with your arms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so when Sir Colin came in, it it was so little. It seemed so little about about the stick, and much more about the music. Mm. Um, I think one of the first things I did. Um, at the academy, we, we had a three-year postgraduate course. By the way, there were six of us, uh, two two people per year, mm -hmm. so there were six of us all together in in the class, and um, some some great great friends and great. They're, they're all gone. All these guys have gone on to have great careers, um, and one girl. We yeah. So one of the earliest um, memories I had was doing Elgar First Symphony with Sir Colin, which mm -hmm. obviously is a piece he, he knew inside out um, with this with the Academy Symphony Orchestra. I was terrified you know thousands of notes um and he he just had a way of corralling all this huge orchestra and and and, and thousands of notes and, and making it look so easy uh and so i was up there on the on the podium you know conducting every single you know comma and and, and it, every punctuation mark and every single note and, and i think his his approach was to try and just give space to the musicians that they could fit in all the notes and you don't have to conduct all the notes for them. Mm. Um, I remember one bit was in six and he, he watched me do this thing in six. And he, Ruman Gabba, where, and he said, where's Colin Metters? Where on earth did you learn to conduct six like that from? <laughs> um, and it, he just couldn't understand. We, we'd been taught one way of doing six and there are, I think, well, there's probably many ways of doing six, but there's two distinct ways, the French way and the German way. And, and needless to say, I was doing the way that Sir Colin didn't do it. So um, he showed me how he would like it to be done. And I, of course, tied myself up in knots, uh, panicking about it and made a r real um, mess of that section. But he was wonderfully encouraging. Um, and he, he would conduct with his eyes, of course, his face, and his whole body. And he, he'd been doing it so long, he didn't have to really think about what his arm was doing. And his arm was very expressive um, uh, as it happens. And mm. coming, coming from uh, Colin Metters and, and George Hurst, wonderful teachers, but, but the sort of rigidity of the technique there, and, and, and we absorbed so much of that, it was, it's, it was a nice contrast to have Sir Colin coming in and letting us yeah. play, basically. I mean, that's, that's an interesting discussion, isn't it? Is that when, at what point do you feel that all of that technical work then becomes just natural because there's a point when you're learning anything whether it's a violin or to conduct or a golf swing or an off drive where you're only thinking about the technique of it um, but there comes a point eventually and it could happen at any point when you've ceased to think about that and the, you just your musicality in conducting uh, terms takes over do you, yes when absolutely. do you think that happens oh it's probably the old ten thousand hours job isn't it that yes you have to yeah do yeah, something yeah. You do. <laughs> so yeah probably about, about that but it's it's tricky because um you get so as a student you get so little time to work with an orchestra unless you're lucky enough to have your own or, or whatever so i mean i actually at the academy um i was i had a couple of amateur orchestras whilst i was studying there so we could put some things into practice um mm. but no it takes i think it takes a lot a lot of time um to, to feel that you can not think too hard about your right and left hands um, as, as a young conductor um, takes it takes a long time and there's just not that much opportunity to, to do it with live musicians and yeah. that's the difficulty that's the difficulty and I, want, I wonder whether and this is a hypothetical question I wonder whether it's easier these days because 
it's so much easier to video yourself whilst you're doing it and take those videos to lessons. And I, I know when I teach, I use video quite a lot to point out goods and bad things that conductors are doing. I wonder whether it's easier now to assimilate this because I would imagine when you were studying and definitely when I was studying, you know, a luxury of a video camera in the room was a rare, rare thing. Yeah, we, we did actually use it at the academy. Um, so that, that was good. We had a lot of video analysis sessions and um, that was wonderful. But the other, the other great thing about uh, sort of a class situation, as I said, it was three years and we had six people in, in, in the class, is that it was sort of, um, you, you were sort of peer regulated as well. So yeah. everyone was in, everyone's encouraged to chip in and not quite pick holes in what you were doing, but, but perhaps in a very friendly way, point out something and then some, sometimes that, the teacher hadn't been able to either put it into w the correct words or or had spotted it so you know your peers were really the colleagues are really important in in your sort of development as a conductor and I found that endlessly fascinating just just the right word at the right time and, and someone's eagle eye might have spotted something that you could you could change. Mm. So during your time at the Royal Academy which as you said was three years um, you were entered or um, suggested to take part in the BBC Young Musician Conductors Workshop, which was a first. That had never happened before. How did that manifest itself and materialise? Yes, it was all quite timely, really. I, I was in my last year at the Academy and had no idea how I was going to go forward. Um, mm. And it turned out that the BBC were running this um, Young Musician of the Year Conductors Workshop, as they called it. Um, so I, I applied. and I think along with many others, we went up to Manchester for the first rounds of auditions with the BBC Philharmonic. I think we got five minutes each to conduct something or other. Um, and that was whittled down to six participants. And we all went back uh, for a week in the studios in Manchester um, with the orchestra and Jan Pascal Tortelier and Martin Brabins led the workshops. So it was sort of part competition, part masterclasses, I suppose. Mm. Um, and we had plenty of time on the podium um, to, to work with both Martin and Pascal and feedback from the orchestra, um, lots of different repertoire. Uh, it was all videoed, all filmed for BBC. It was, they made a program out of it. Um, and the end of the week, they chose three of us to participate in a concert. We each did a piece and each did a movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto as well um, as, as the sort of competition, competition finale. And I happened to win it, which was which was great, and became assistant conductor of the BBC Philharmonic. Um, so that was yeah, in my last year of the academy. It was, it was really it was a great experience actually, um, and lovely people. And the three of us, just in case you were interested, in the final were Stuart Stratford, who's now mm -hmm. um, music director of Scottish Opera, and Tim Redmond, who's um, also yeah. got a great career and uh, I think he's over in the States at the moment uh, but uh, we still keep in touch occasionally. <laughs> so the assistant job at the BBC Phil was that the typical assistant job where you shadow the music director you're around for balance and occasionally you end up in the library putting Bowens in or were you, <laughs> was, was it was it a different sort of role? It, it was actually very different I mean I mean I think it, because it was the first time it had been offered. I think they made the prize assistant conductor, and then they were going to see um, how it worked with the person that won. Mm. Actually, as, as it happened, pretty shortly after I won the competition, I, uh, they needed the conductor for a um, concert. The conductor had gone sick. So they phoned me up and asked if I'd like to jump in. And mm. I did, and it went okay. So um, from then on, I just was racing up and down between London and Manchester. They offered me a lot of concerts, a lot of studio recordings, and very, very occasionally um, getting to assist, uh, mm. which didn't happen very much at all. Um, I, I remember assisting, I think Leonard Slatkin wanted someone to be there when he came. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I, actually, I remember just, I was around and about at the proms, so I would sit and listen to balance there when the orchestra came down. Um, in hindsight, I would have liked two years of, Basically, you know, it sounds stupid, but not conducting and sitting oh. and observing and, and, you know, questioning visiting conductors like many other assistant posts are. But that wasn't how it happened. And I sort of, um, I did so much with them in the first few years. Uh, that was a steep, steep learning curve. But the orchestra 
having sort of chosen me because they had to vote in this uh, competition, they were very supportive. And, um, you know, I've known some of them for, for years and years, well, since 1998, actually. Mm. Some of them are still there. They're, they're, they're always very nice. And, you know, they, they're encouraging and words of wisdom um, used to come from them. And, you know, insider tips, all that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it sort of feels like my orchestral family, the BBC Philharmonic. Well, I suppose that's, isn't that, you know, there are two ways there as you as we've just discussed that you know the, there's the way of sitting there for two years li- watching lots of people rehearse and figuring out what's good and what's not good and, and learning from the bad as well as the good but not actually doing much conducting and then uh, after that having to put it all into practice or doing it what you did which is you're literally thrown in the, the, the deep end but there are a few people around who will help you try and swim um, yeah, you know, in the yeah, orchestra, exactly. Uh, and, and you know, there are pros and cons for both ways of doing it. But learning from an orchestra from the inside and, and them helping you is invaluable invi- advice. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would think that would be the perfect way, but initially, probably a bit of a shock, I think. Bit, bit of a shock, and you you learn some lessons very quickly <laughs> as well. And there, you know, the, the great thing about the BBC Phil is um, they they are and were a, a fun loving band, and they've you know in those early days they just had so many jokes and um, you know just to keep keep things bubbling along. So mm. it was always a, a barrel of laughs, and sometimes it, it you know could feel a bit intimidating. But um, as I say I, I felt nothing but friendliness from them. So that's also a huge support that gives you confidence that you're sort of doing okay. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, whilst we're with the BBC Phil, I'm going to slightly jump off topic or, you know, uh, uh, off the chronological line and go forward to some, uh, obviously you've done lots of broadcasts, but also some studio recordings for Shandos of film music. Um, mm. And I wondered what your approach was to it, because with film music, you've got a bit of a choice here that you either try and make it as much like, like the soundtrack as possible or you put your own spin on it or an interpretation on it or I mean they're wonderful discs so I just wonder what your approach was with them um and obviously there were so, so many different composers as well so yeah yeah a, a great range um well I remember being invited to 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 do these I think at the suggestion of the um manager of the BBC firm like then they recommended me to Shandos Mm. And also summoned to Colchester for a meeting with the big boss. And um, he made it very clear. He said, in no uncertain terms, there's to be no interpretation on me. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he sort of thought that we should just do a carbon copy of the, um, of the film soundtrack. Needless to say, I completely ignored him yeah. <laughs> um, for many reasons. But w- one of them being that uh, we deployed the full forces of the BBC Philharmonic. And it was, so it was way bigger than any studio orchestra would have been. Mm. And that, you know, has its own implications as to how you, you do the music. It's, it's a different kind of sound. And also, I, I just find it very hard to do things that are imposed upon me. Um, mm. So, I, so I've, always, I've never conducted ballet, and I, I don't think that I, I would. Um, for, for, a, for a similar reason, maybe I've, maybe I've misinterpreted that. But um, anyway, I, I watched all the films that I could get hold of. Not all of them existed, and not all of the films used all of the soundtrack in it, all of all of the music. So you had to make your own decisions anyway. So I thought, let's just do this as if it were, a, you know, symphony or something, and I've got mm. to find my own way through it interpretively. And, I, and that's that's what I did. And the first couple of discs were a huge success. So. Um, we continued the way we did. It's great. Well, well, it works. I mean, you know, the 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 playing is really joyous, and you know, and and yeah, I've I've loved those discs. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the problem. I I've done quite a lot of film concerts, and and often the music you're playing is not exactly what is on the film. So you know, you have to hmm. put an informed hmm. spin on it, and you have to work your way through corners. You know, there's a story about the last ten minutes of. E.T. the film being cut to the, the soundtrack, which is true. Yeah. But the music that you play in the suite that's published is not the same ten minutes from the end of the film. So you know you have to yes. you have to massage it a bit. You have to play with yeah. it a bit. But I think it was the right approach. And I think you know these composers would you know they'd be spinning in their grave if they thought you were you were restricted in any way. You've got to make the music speak, and I'm sure they would allow you the freedom 
now it's divorced from the pictures to, to, to make music out of it. So while you're assistant conductor of the BBC Philharmonic, obviously you're guest conducting around the world, and I'm assuming that it would be on one of those first dates uh, with an orchestra that you first met the Iceland Symphony Orchestra. Um, how was that first date? Was it love at first sight, or was it a, a relationship that blossomed over over many visits? Um, I think it was it was fairly quick actually. Um, I went for the first time and thoroughly enjoyed it. Loved the energy of the musicians, and they seemingly liked me as well. So they invited me back for two more concerts. I think the following season they were looking for a music director, um, and I, I remember there were other people in the running. Uh, so I went back, and I remember after I think it was after the first concert I went back, or anyway, quite quite near the beginning. A group of players came and, and said, Have, has anyone spoken to you about becoming music director yet? And I said, well, no, I was rather taken aback. <laughs> so they all sort of said, what management haven't done it for? <laughs> Grumbling. Um, anyway, it turned out that um, the orchestra eventually voted for me to become their new music director, which was, you know, really nice. It was the first job I'd had. And mm. I, I just, I loved it because I felt that the orchestra themselves had asked me, to, which they had, to become yes. music director. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of, you know, I hadn't pushed myself or, or I hadn't been sort of headhunted by a manager or, or something like that. So um, it was the beginning of, um, I think it was eight years in the end I did, or was it longer? Gosh, <laughs> such a long time ago now. <laughs> but it was, um, you know, I really fell in love with the country and, and, and the musicians, they're wonderful people. And being a music director, um, because you, you were there for, According to Wikipedia, that trustworthy source, you were there <laughs> between uh, 2002 and 2010, but then also that sort of overlapped with uh, the start of Norland's o opera in Sweden. Mm. Uh, and, oh, yeah. then, and then not uh, not long after Iceland, you started in Aalborg. Um, yes. So obviously being a music director is something you enjoy, but uh, do you enjoy all the aspects of it? Because it's not <laughs> just choosing the programmes. You know, you've got to go to receptions. You might need to go to a meeting with sponsors or funders um you know and even dare i say hiring and firing depending on the orchestra who's in charge of that so did you enjoy all the aspects um no <laughs> <laughs> well, I... an honest answer good excellent <laughs> um you know I, I loved a lot of it and and I, you know i loved the contact just being being there 12 14 weeks a year um, yeah. and seeing seeing the, seeing the band regularly and all that but yeah the, the hiring and firing was um, pretty pretty tough, and mm. well, I, he, the manager was lovely. He wasn't a musician uh, at the time, and um, you know, sort of saw things differently. I don't, I don't think it, it would be allowed to happen these days. So, uh, right. but a lot, a lot, a lot. I felt a lot was put on me to to make those sorts of decisions. And um, well, there you are. It's just one of the things that we had to do. I think music director is a bit more protected now. I don't know, um, mm. but the trouble was. They were a lovely bunch of Icelandic musicians, mainly the a few foreigners. But you know, a they're all they've all grown up together, most of them. And they all know each other and, and probably related to one another. So um, you know, sort of firing someone is like firing uh, your brother or sister. I mean, it was it was it was tough sometimes. Yeah. But um, but I think everyone saw it was for the best. I mean, talking about firing, it just sounds like, you know, I had a blazing stand-up row, but it, it, you know, it usually was someone who was coming to the end of their career, you know, couldn't, couldn't really play their instrument very well anymore. And, um, uh, one guy just took it so well. Mm. <laughs> you know, he, 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 he saw it coming, but he just didn't want to make the first move, if you, if you know what I mean. So, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was tough, but as I say, everyone everyone saw us for the best. I think in, in the long run, but um, I think we all ended up friends. Um, <laughs> we had some good time, good times together. And I still go back, which is great. And I left just before the concert hall was the new concert hall was built, Harpa, which is uh, you know quite well known now. Yeah. Um, but 2010 was when I finished, and that's it was about then that the crash happened, wasn't it? Or was it no? It's 2008 the crash. So the last few years were, were sort of tricky with um, with money, and they stopped building the concert hall which i should have opened um 
so it was a, it was a difficult time. All our to international tours were cancelled. Uh, I felt very sorry for the orchestra, but they seem to be um, healthy now. Mm. I mean, going back on that subject, I suppose that's one of the benefits of orchestras now starting to have um, HR departments, um, which you know didn't really exist until you know, probably the last 15, 20 years or so, or maybe even yes. um, less, maybe the last 10 years or so. But I think having an HR department takes the pressure off, you know, chief executive mm. and music director when it comes to things like that, when you know, have musicians who are nearing the end of their career and, and an HR department will at least help. Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, going on it and looking at Norland's Opera in Sweden, that's an even bigger task uh, of management um with many 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 more people i'm assuming many more people but um many more sort of managers managing right. things um yeah. so uh, actually i f i was left to do the music pretty much i mean in sweden they do like meetings <laughs> uh, they're so democratic that uh, yeah everything needs a meeting about me that used to drive me mad um and what was the other thing that used to drive me mad oh Gosh, yes, um, it's, it's the, the, the striving for equality. And uh, I, I, gosh, it's difficult to talk about, but I, I struggled with being told I had to have a certain amount of um, female composers in the season, and mm. female conductors and female soloists, which, which was, I think, good. But it, we, we, we did occasionally accept, um, accept things um, by committee, that weren't of uh, the high, highest level, you know, mm. uh, if, if I'm explaining myself badly here, but um, no, 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 I, I, felt, I, I felt we were crowbarring sometimes things in just to just to tick boxes, which I, I didn't feel that comfortable about. But that, that was, you know, fairly rare, to be honest. Mm. Um, but apart from all the meetings, um, there's a lo lovely team up there. Um, so it was a, it's a cult, sort of a culture house, um, which had obviously a symphony orchestra in there and ballet. Uh, department, dance department, um, visual art, and opera. Mm. So it was it was really nice, and we could do quite a lot of projects which involved everybody. And we put a lot of festivals on. Um, and I was there when Umeå was the capital of culture of Europe, capital culture of Europe. Mm. Um, sorry, European capital, <laughs> European <laughs> culture capital, <laughs> European <laughs> culture capital in um, 2014. Yeah. And that was that was really amazing that that that, that whole year of putting on cultural events for mm. for yeah for the city but for, for Europe and um, yeah we ended up doing this huge outdoor production of Electra, um, which had you know, towering giants. It was um, directed by Furadel Spaus, who did the um, opening ceremony for the Barcelona Olympics. So mm. it was very very extravagant, and um, you know we just. We we were in the habit then of uh, back in those days of just trying to really think really big and and not letting anything get in our way um, and it was so wonderfully creative times and um, lovely memories uh, and of course just being in northern Sweden you had winters harsh winters proper winters snow all the time minus twenty six degrees but summers were the opposite and you know up to thirty degrees swimming in the lakes and. Um, so, you know, as much as I love the music, I, I love the people, I, I love the country, actually, up there. And then on in 2011 to Aalborg in Denmark. So the Scandinavian countries, though, I'm sure Iceland wouldn't want to be listed as Scandinavian, but they seem to have played quite a big part of your career. Yeah, um, not particularly by design. I, I love Scandinavia, um, Nordic countries. I, I like the way they work. I like their, their attitude um, and, and the way they apply themselves and the fact that everyone gets time to um, have, you know, the, the social systems are pretty good. So mm. everyone has time to, to practice, to look after their families um, and to do other things. So you're typically working 10 till 2 every day as an orchestra. And then, you know, you come back the next day at 10 o'clock and you find that people have had time to look at the notes in between or think about things um, and you know it's it's different than working in the UK so you work in Scandinavia it's typically Monday Tuesday Wednesday 10 till 2 rehearsals and then you know a, a general rehearsal on Thursday morning and a concert Thursday and Friday Saturday whatever um, in the evening so there's a lot of space around it for people to um, also have lives 
Mm. That's true. I've worked in Finland and also in Norway in Trondheim, which was exactly that rehearsal schedule. And it just mm. gives time for things to bed in. And then when you get to the concerts, we did one on Thursday and then a school's concert Friday morning and then a, another concert on Friday evening. And yeah, everything feels ready and, and, and sorted and nobody feels rushed. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the, from two o'clock onwards every day during the opening part of the week, they can get on with their lives. Um, and as you say, it gives them time to, to for the music to bed in or, or just to have a little practice between. Um, yeah, they're not doing three session days from 10 to 1, 2 to 5, 6 to 9, and then <laughs> crash, <laughs> crashing and doing it again. Um, yeah. Uh, then having to drive for an hour to get home or whatever. Get the train exactly, for an hour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, an interesting byproduct of working in Scandinavia, um, it was a question somebody asked me the other day, and that's not what I've asked before on the podcast. Are you much of a linguist, having worked in you know Iceland, Sweden, Denmark, and all around Europe? Do you try and rehearse anything at all in their language? I mean, I know the Scandinavian countries speak very good English, and most people rehearse in English. But elsewhere, do you rehearse in other languages? It the orchestras now that seem to be so international that um, it's English is the language of rehearsals. Um, mm. I, I remember when I started out, I was working quite a lot in Spain, and most of the musicians were, were well, quite a lot of them were Spanish. There were a lot of Eastern European um, string players, but they all understood Spanish. So I would, I, I, I can do a bit of Spanish. So I, I would do rehearsals in, in sort of pidgin Spanish. Mm. I studied that at school and, and, and French. But no, I think it, it's just to make myself as clear as possible, I think English seems to, seems to work. Um, in fact, some orchestras, you know, before you even start the rehearsal, the rehearsals will be in English, won't they? <laughs> they always get a shock, the orchestras. They, after, if I meet them for the first time, someone will always come up and say, gosh, your English is terribly good. Um, <laughs> because my name, Ruben Gamba, it looks like I, well, someone once said, I, it sounds like I'm a boarding house in Namibia. <laughs> Where does your name it's, come from? <laughs> uh, well, I, my, both my parents are English. I think way back in my family, there's... Um, a bit of Italian French, and that's where Gamba came came from. Mm. And Rumen is a Cornish name, actually. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, that. Yeah, so there's um, there, there's a Saint Saint Rumen's in Tavistock, in, um, so uh, yeah, I've never met anyone else with this, with the same name. But um, yes, so a bit of Cornish and Italian. Well, I've learned something new today. <laughs> Super. Um, I ask everybody the next question because. It turns out that there are quite a few conducting geeks who listen to the podcast and they love the answers to this question, even though <laughs> um, people you know, people seem to have a different system. But what is your system for learning a new score or revisiting an old one? Would you sit at a desk and work through it or would you go to the piano? Do you mark things in your scores, uh, red, blue, black pencil, anything like that? Or are you like about 50% of the conductors I've spoken to who prefer their schools to be nice and white and virginal? Um, I do make markings, minimal pens, light pencil markings, certainly not with the blue um, crayons. Mm. Uh, um, I, 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 you know, I, and, and I suppose scores I've revisited over the years get a few more markings, some get less. Um, it, it really depends, but I, I do like to sit down with the score first of all and um, not touch a piano or listen to a recording or anything mm. just to you know, find, see if I can find my way through it and imagine stuff in my head. Um, and occasionally a piano is useful, but um, I don't do too much there. Um, and I, I love to listen to recordings, but only after I've sort of found my interpretation, if you like, and, and yeah. how I'm going to do the piece. I, I sort of listen to recordings just to see if what is possible on the orchestra. You know, it, it, you go, oh, that, okay, so that tempo does work or, mm. or whatever it might be. Um, but occasionally I've, I've listened to a recording before even getting the score of a piece that I don't know. And I will instinctively go, well, that, that's not how I'll do it. Even though I don't know the, <laughs> the piece or have the notes. It's very strange. Mm. Or, you know, you think that's just too fast for this music or that's not, that's not how I do it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to be quite a quick learner um, of, of, of the notes. Uh, so uh, getting a score, um, I can I can turn it around quite quickly, which is useful for when one has to jump in, uh, yes. which you do if you're lucky as a, as a young conductor. And um, 
so that's that's been quite useful for me actually uh, i have an amusing story about listening to re recordings that you've just made me think of actually um because recordings are there's a bit of a snobbery about listening to recordings as a conductor whilst you're learning um, the process but sometimes it's unavoidable having heard a piece of music beforehand and i remember the first time i ever played the anacheck sinfonietta and I think we were, we were born about a year apart, you and I, Ruben. And, and I think mm -hmm. you would remember a program that called Crown Court that used to be on ITV, which was uh, actors um, acting out real court cases. And the music was the movement from the Anacheck Symphonietta, the ba 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 That was the theme music for this TV show. So whenever I was off ill from school as a kid, this would be on, I'd be lying on the sofa. And so that music was going into my head. And when I came to play it for the first time, I had no idea that it wasn't in three beats in the bar. It, it's, <laughs> yes. it, it's in two. But as a kid, I'd learnt it as one and two and three. Yeah, and yeah, one, yeah. Two, three and one. I had no idea. I could not play it. It was a, I was a professional violinist <laughs> in the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. And I was sat there and I could not put the two music into my head and turn it into what it should be. It's just you know, how recordings can influence your hearing of something is the reason for telling the story. Um, yes, yeah. so it's like the old Star Wars theme, isn't it? That it, it, it's um, everyone thinks it's um, da 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 yeah. da with the emphasis on there, but it's da 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 da. <laughs> yes, the first beat of the bar. So exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The, the the problems of listening to things. Ruman, it is ten questions time, and as usual, I start with, what sound or noise do you love, and what sound or noise do you hate? Well, the sound I love, and I've only come to love it in the last three years, because that's where how long I've been living in my house in Suffolk. We mm -hmm. used to live in London, but we moved out to Suffolk. Um, and it comes around every May when the Swifts return to our, to our town. Um, and they've been coming here for many, many, many years, all that journey from Africa. And you can hear them. Uh, they're called screaming parties, uh, mm. if, if you're a wildlife expert, and they all gather together. They don't, the only time they land is to um, nest mm. and have them bring up their young. Otherwise, they're on the wing the whole time. They sleep and eat on the wing. But um, to hear the swifts and see them circling above our heads and making this amazing noise on a beautiful May evening, it's one of the best things in the world. We're lucky to live in a quite, quite a quiet place, so you just hear the swifts. Um, and it, they're absolutely gorgeous and it always everywhere I am in the world now where I hear Swifts it reminds me of, of home um, and the noise I hate mm. motorbikes <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I, I feel a bit um, a bit nerdy by saying this you know I, I, sh I don't like fast motorbikes I don't like motorbikes um, for various reasons but I can't stand the noise when a really noisy one races past you or races past your house it's it's such an ear-splitting ugly noise that I could quite happily uh, live without hearing another motorbike in my life. If you had 24 hours free what would you spend it doing? I th oh gosh I think I'm going to say I'd like to go off on my bicycle and camp in the middle of nowhere with a you know very small lightweight tent um, and not see another human being. Um, <laughs> I've I've recently I've, yeah, I mean I'm not not a hugely committed cyclist. I have a bicycle and um, I, I would love to. I have never done it. I'd love to just go with a tent. I don't know. You probably have to have a very super light one uh, and just sort of go wild camping in the middle of nowhere. That's that's what I fancy doing. Twenty four hours off. Who would be a favourite conductor of yesteryear? Um, I'm going to say Leonard Bernstein, mm. um, purely because of the way he approached music. Um, I, I wouldn't say he was the uh, neatest, most um, technically precise conductor, but uh, that always need that. Uh, I just, I just loved his energy. Well, I loved his music as well, um, and uh, just watching him conduct, it was a real force of nature. Um, and mu music just spewed forth 
from him and, and you know that, that's what it's all about really so yes Leonard Bernstein for me and who would be a favorite current conductor um I'm I really enjoyed watching Ivan Fisher and his mm. approach to, to to everything um whether it's you know the, the way he talks about music the way he conducts the way he thinks about his orchestra and wants his orchestra to, to play I think the whole package is is really interesting um and you know he is a a great communicator and a great a really great conductor and mm. I, I also i also like the way he does most of his music as well that his interpretations and and you know it's very thoughtful very intelligent but wonderfully expressive conducting and, and playing from mus musicians um great feel for rubato and the spur you know the sort of spur of the moment things i, I think it's you know, spontaneity is also wonderful yeah really admire him what is the hardest work you have ever conducted I'm going to say something that I think you know a lot about as well, and it's um, Peter Maxwell Davis's, Sir Peter Maxwell Davis's World's Bliss, which <laughs> was the toughest piece I've ever had to conduct, and I know you've conducted it as well. I have, and do you know what? There is a third person who also gave this answer. Uh, oh, Leonard, really? Yeah, Leonard Slatkin gave the same, exactly the yes. same piece. Yeah. Um, oh, good, yeah. Um, also, it, it stays in my memory because I had to spend bloody Christmas holidays learning it um <laughs> I'd, I'd left it a bit too late and it, I think the concerts were, it was BBC Symphony Orchestra uh, to celebrate Max's 70th birthday in the Barbican and the concerts I think were in January or, or something so yeah I sort of ruined my Christmas holiday it's wonderful music but yeah. really really tricky and um it's a it's a workout with the orchestra um mm. and but yeah somehow we got through it <laughs> I think <laughs> was, and was Max there when you did it? Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. He was, deli he was delighted. Yeah, I, 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 it was 10 years later for his 80th birthday, and he was there when I did it. And it sort of puts an extra pressure on it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that. It's, what is it, 31 minutes or something? And I've never oh, it's concentrated. a bit longer than that, I think. Yeah. But I've never concentrated so hard in my life. Uh, no, same here. I know. Goodness yeah. me. And, and, you know, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm you sort of need uh, some sort of maths degree to work out the Venn diagram of, of putting a rehearsal order together for that piece because lots of people sit there doing nothing for a lot of time. So I'm mm, sort of mm. doing 25 minutes with just the trumpets and the xylophones and then and then I call in the horns to go with the, with the violas and cellos and bass for another section and two harps and the organ and oh my god uh, yeah but yeah. And it was in, in the concert I did, it was of course it was a celebration of, of his music. So we had all sorts of other bits and bobs of his as well. So yeah. so that was that was only forty minutes of the concert. Oh goodness! But <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lovely occasion. He was he was a very sweet man. Yes, he was. I totally agree. When travelling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? Yeah, it's. It's quite boring, I think, but anyway, it's a whole stack of papers, um, the Sunday papers. Uh, I don't really get that much time at home to, to, to read um, the papers. And when I'm away, it tends to be for a week, certainly with symphonic work. And I like to go and sit in restaurants and bars on my own. So a big stack of papers is the perfect thing to work your way through, or well, let alone the aeroplane to get there, in fact. Um, so I try and make them last all week and try to read most, you know, almost every word. But it's, it's a kind of a nice pleasure to sit back with a drink and work your way through the papers from back home. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? I would change one word, and it's the word maestro. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a word I can't stand for many reasons. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I, it's, it, it always seems strange to me when I was, a tw I think, 26 was the first time I conducted and got called maestro by some really old guy. And I just thought, that's ridiculous. You can't be calling me maestro. Um, uh, and it's either that or they've forgotten your name, so they'll just use maestro instead of <laughs> room. And, uh, um, yeah, it's just got horrible connotations, like you're this um, strange kind of dictator. But I think things are slightly different these days. So, yeah, don't call me maestro, please. Just call me room. <laughs> Uh, well, that's three things we have in common now. Um, I, I that was the, the that was the sound or noise I hated when I uh, when I answered this in episode one. It was the word maestro, 
Uh, we've got world's bliss in common, and also I know you're a big cricket fan. So you know, yes. yeah, we ought to go. We ought to sit down and over a beer and watch a game of cricket and uh, not call each other maestro. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, it, it, it has to be something to do with food, and not not necessarily eating it, but cooking it. I'm quite a food nerd now. Um, over the last few years, I I, I love baking. Bread, I, can, I cook sourdough bread. I, I, I do all the cooking when I'm at home um, for the kids and, and my wife and like experimenting. I think I'd like to have, I remember going, working in Japan and one of the orchestra taking me out to this place, which this, he, I think he was an Irish guy had, just him. Um, you could, it was a tiny place, you could sit and have a beer and he would cook food in front of you um, and just give you whatever he happened to be cooking in the pan at that time and you had it and then he put something else on and they, you know then my friend would say um oh have you got some of that can you make some of that stuff you made last week and he'd go oh sure yeah have another beer and at the end of the night um he just said oh that'll be you know twenty dollars or whatever it is he, you know, <laughs> very very and i just thought oh, how wonderful i'd kind of like to have a place like that mm. that sounds great um which means i'm now looking forward to the answer to question number 10 if the world had to end tonight, <laughs> what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, the drink is going to be, I'm, I'm a huge Real Ale fan. Um, you know, fully paid up member of Camera, the campaign for Real Ale. So it, it's going to be a pint of, actually, it's going to be a pint of Harvey's Best Bitter from mm -hmm. Sussex, where I grew up. Mother's Milk. Um, beautiful drink and so no I'm a, I'm a huge uh, ale fan and um, would, would fight for I mean to, to, this drink is is amazing it's it's alive it's um, fresh it's not you know pasteurized kegged or anything like this anyway let's not go down the real ale path it'll be real ale <laughs> and, gosh I've really tussled with this one it's going to be you can give me anything that's been cooked well on an open fire Mm. And I know there's a huge trend for this in, in restaurants now, but I just am addicted to food which has been cooked on wood, for instance. Um, there's a wonderful restaurant in Auckland in New Zealand called Depo. This, this, this sort of celebrity chef, Al Brown, does it. And he has a huge fire and cooks all sorts of things, whether, whether it's uh, shellfish or meat or veggies. Uh, and I could just sit there and be past this kind of food forever so anything that has been cooked on an open flame not a burger really necessarily mm. but but something more, more interesting real wood fire i think that's that's what i would say that sounds amazing it's also sounds very similar to a restaurant that my wife and i are desperate to visit and um, <laughs> it's probably almost as far away uh, it's in the mendoza area of argentina it's called the seven fires and it's owned by another celebrity chef called francis malman um, there's seven different ways of cooking food on an open fire. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, because it's in Argentina, you can guess what's going on those fires. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, with Malbec and all of that. So, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, what a, what a meal it would be. Yes, um, exactly. And what fun I've had. I've really enjoyed the last hour chatting to you, Ruman. And maybe one day, and uh, I will put my hand in my pocket and I will email you, Mark Wigglesworth, Ed Gardner and Daniel Harding and we'll get a box at Lord's and we'll watch a day's cricket because all of us love cricket and I think that would be a wonderful way to spend some time in the future. So thank you. Well, we love cricket, don't we? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a member at Lord's, so I'll, I'll take you in. Don't worry. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Let's meet. <laughs> thank you, Ruman. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mike. You really enjoyed it. A Mic on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal, with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I talk to a Venezuelan conductor who can count Daniel Barenboim as being one of his mentors. His career has been truly global, having conducted in many of the world's leading opera houses, and soon he starts a new job here in the UK when he becomes Chief Conductor of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra in 2021. Until then, bye-bye!